Hello everyone, welcome back to the Bucket Think Tank for Comics of the Week, and today we're going to start off with Action Comics number 991. So, this story, instead of being like, I don't know, a regular story, instead of continuing where we left off with Action Comics 1003, this story skips ahead to, I guess, a few days or at least a day after, with Clark bringing his story on the Red Cloud to Perry, and Perry questioning whether or not this was actually Red Cloud or Red Tornado that they saw, and... This effect is there to make Clark doubt whether or not his story is as true as he thinks it is. And I felt that was a bit amateurish, like Clark should know this. But this is primarily just to give us a good look at how the Daily Planet works. And there's even some back and forth with Clark and Miss Good before Perry calls him into the office where Trish shows an image of Lex meeting Lois at her apartment at night. And Trish wondering what he has to say about the implication of this possible affair. And Perry says, look, it's just a reporter meeting with the ex-president because that's apparently still in continuity. And Perry effectively kicks Trish out. And Perry goes off a bit of a tangent about, you know, this is ridiculous, along with the mysterious owner of the Daily Planet, who Perry still hasn't met yet. And Perry turns around to find out that Clark is gone. Clark is in the janitor's closet because that's what Clark does. And he has a flashback to what we all wanted to see, which was Clark and Lois meeting. They embrace, they kiss, it's sweet. And then they go to her apartment and they do the deed. And then they talk about John. And it's all just sort of really casual. Sort of like, oh yeah, John's doing fine. It's like... It's like as if, you know, Clark does not already have a really rocky relation with jor you know, after the events of the Oz Effect. It's just sort of weird. They think it's like his actual grand, like, you know, a normal grandpa. Like, oh yeah, um, John just went around to hang around with, you know, Pa Kent or Grandpa Kent, you know, the good one. But no, no, totally ignoring everything else that happened. And Lois talks about why the reason she didn't come back was because she had to write. And she'd come to realize that... Even though she totally left because she didn't feel safe, but she felt safe with John being with her crazy father-in-law, um, she felt she needed to write, that she had to go back and be a reporter. And she realized that the normal life just isn't who they are. Like, those normal rules cannot and do not apply to them. It doesn't apply to John, doesn't apply to Lois, doesn't apply to Clark. They all have other things to do. And then they do the deed again. And Lois says, like, look, we aren't, I don't want us to split up, but I have to write. This is who I am, and I can't deny that part of myself any longer. So it's really just a couple talking about where they're going forward, effectively with, you know, the, John's out of the house now. What are we going to do? And she sort of, like, wants to find this other part of herself again. And it's sweet, but it also feels kind of bad like we're sort of under sort of forgetting everything else we've learned and all the issues leading up to Bendis taking over and before we can go to a proper ending Clark has Clark here like oh no the world needs me and it's once again a bunch of things happening at pretty much the same time that Superman has to stop including Copperhead attacking the Daily Planet to shoot Trish he stops that drops Copperhead off has a back and forth with Miss Good about, you know, the Red Cloud story, and Perry does the coolest thing ever. He's like, so, um, Clark, uh, Superman, do I have cancer? He scans Perry, like, you're good, and he goes off, and Superman and Lois hug in the night sky, which is a beautiful scene, but this story just feels like, I, I just can't do it anymore. I, I really just can't. So, first of all, the Clark and Lois thing should have been the entire issue. It really should have. There's nothing that we gained from that little bit of the Daily Planet. That was at least three to four pages. All right, of nothing. There's no real update on the Red Cloud story or anything. No update on Miss Good, on the Invisible Mafia, which are all really great things. Bendis here seems to want to tell at least two to three different stories in one book, and he's not juggling them properly. His Invisible Mafia storyline, I think, is really great, really solid, love it. And that's sort of it. The Clark and Lois thing feels very non-Clark and Lois. He, like... Even if I nitpick the idea that I don't think Lois calls Clark baby, I just I just don't get it. I don't care that they bumped uglies in this book. I really don't. It's nice to know. We already know that they could. That's how John's here. So what we're trying to bring a more normal aspect to it, sure, but we totally removed John from the equation. You know, the Kent family was one of the things everyone loved about um, Rebirth. The fact that, you know, Jonathan Kent was, well, John Kent was back. You know, the idea of pre-Flashpoint, Lois brought her baby to term, and they had this kid, they were kept secret, and then it brought to the public life. You know, 
John became Superboy, and it was all really fun, really great stuff. That's what people loved about Tomasi writing Superman in action comics. Here, it's just not there. And also, pet peeve, but it really is hurting my mind here. Why does the art keep changing every issue? I just, I just don't do it. Stop doing it. Okay? If you want to finish this story and then change art, fine. Totally makes sense. But this is distracting. Anyway, coming up to Detective Comics number 991. So, Batman and Two-Face begin their talk. And like the detective Batman is, he lays down the case. And he's like, okay, so I know you killed Hal Frank, knowing his real name was Carl Twist, who was the man who got off on the la from the last case of... District Attorney Harvey Dent, before Sal Moroni threw acid on his face and sent Harvey Dent down the path of the binary. And he says, that makes sense, but it doesn't. Something else is going on here. And Two-Face goes, goes off with the fact, you know, that the reason Carl Twist got off was because of some corrupt Gotham cops messing with the evidence. And when Two-Face found out that Twist was back in town selling weapons to <clears throat> Cobra... That was when he decided to get involved, but Batman doesn't believe all of that. There's something more to it. Two-Face then says he didn't kill Twist, and that he was about to say who did until Gordon shows up, and apparently Two-Face just loses his mind like, Oh, you lied, you lied, and he jumps off the building, which Batman looks at Gordon and says, Give me a moment, and he just jumps off and saves Two-Face. It's ultimately pointless. I didn't know where it was supposed to go with that. But then we bring back the story. Two-Face then reveals who really did kill Carl Twist, that it was Harvey Dent. So, seeing Twist back in Gotham City, and planning to bring terrorism to Gotham City through Cobra, effectively made Harvey, who was apparently, according to Two-Face, already starting to push out. He was starting to break out of the Two-Face persona. He was starting to become the dominant personality. And this just sort of sent Harvey over the edge. He effectively pushed the Two-Face persona out. And by the time Two-Face came back in control, he was already standing over Carl Twist's body. And Two-Face, or possibly even a third persona, says that he couldn't have Harvey killing people. Harvey's supposed to be the good one. So Two-Face shot him the second time and hired the two Fireflies to torture the place to make everyone think it was him as opposed to Harvey. It's a very complicated red herring. Because it was him, but it wasn't him, and there's a third persona possibly, but Gordon then gives us a rundown on the interrogation of the Cobra members at the GCPD headquarters, pointing out that most, not all of them, had explosive chips in their heads that would kill them. The one that wasn't dead talked about how, yeah, Cobra's here, I'm sorry, mm -mm. Cobra is here because... They feel that they've been forgotten about, that no one takes them seriously. You know, their members are starting to be afraid of Leviathan. People don't even remember that they're a threat to the world. So they came to Gotham City to remind people. And then the chip kills them. And Two-Face then reveals that, well, Cobra also has all these other hot spots. As five of them, I saw them, and he reveals them, and the comic ends with the GCPD, Batman, and Two-Face going towards those spots. This was a really fun issue. I really do. I said it before, I love Two-Face, love Harvey Dent, love the dichotomy of good and evil. Um, I didn't quite like the fact that uh, Two-Face just jumps off a building. That, to me, felt really stupid. But overall, I loved it. I love, I love how tortured Harvey is. I love when the villains of the DC of, of Gotham City really show how messed up they are, that they do need help. We sort of tease with it and go back and forth with Harley, but I love it when we're very consistent with with um, with Harvey Dent and Two-Face. Speaking of messed up characters, Wonder Woman issue 57, because Wonder Woman's not in a good place right now. So Diana wakes up in what looks like the moon, but the appearance of Witchfire, uh, who was killed... Um, an episode, an issue, the issue before the previous one, reveals that this is effectively an artificial construct of the moon created by Hecate to hold the consciousness of those who bear the witch mark. So there's an there's a sleeping version of Manitou Don, the sleeping version of Black Orchid and Witchfire, but Diana is there. She still has her color. Everyone else is gray, and Witchfire believes this is because of your demigod status and. Witchfire is dead, so she's just walking around. So she's able to be awake while the other two are asleep. Meanwhile, Zatan and Constantine try to figure out what to do about this Hecate Wonder Woman, and John reveals that he can feel the rules of magic changing. 
and courtesy of Hecate and Zatanna thinks the best bet would be to exercise Hecate for Diana. You know, just to like force it out. Meanwhile, Black Orchid lays waste to the Parliament of Trees as Swamp Thing tries to subdue her while Manitou Don attempts to apprehend Detective Chimp and the others only to be stopped by Tracy Thirteen, Nightshade, and I think June Moon. She was the only one who didn't speak in that scene. Um, it's also revealed that if Black Orchid is successful, the pain of the green will sink to the red and that will affect the rot. It will affect all these other magical energies that help build the world and help make life. You know, Back on the Not Moon, or the, the Magic Moon, or the Witch Moon, Diana talks about how she really wasn't ready to deal with magic. Like, the rules don't make sense, you know, that she deals with the gods and, you know, the Greek pantheon. They have rules and that... And they're very set and easy to understand. Once you know those rules, you can you can beat the gods. And Witchfire says that magic doesn't have those absolute rules. That its power does in part come from nothing being set in such rigid rigid ways. And maybe Hecate is right that magic has gone too long as one thing and it needs to change. Back with Zatanna, she's able to distract Hecate for Hecate to just long enough for Constantine's bonding spell to work. And the only reason it's so effective is because magic is all over the place. It's all haywire and unstable. And they're able to exercise not just Hecate uh, from Wonder Woman, but they're also able to exercise her from Black Orchid and Manitou Dawn. And for a moment, Dan is back in her body, but is then pushed back to the moon. Witchfire theorizes that what happened was that when Orchid and Dawn broke free from all that power... All that power went back into Diana's body, and she couldn't take the stress, and she's effectively dead. So, Wonder Woman issue 57 really felt like we were just sort of retreading old ground. It it really did. It felt like we really did just continue issue 56, and you'd think that was a good thing. But I mean just sort of how we feel from a progression standpoint. Um, nothing really changed. We could have just as easily said, done this entire thing with, you know, Wonder Woman on the moon talking to Witchfire. And nothing would have changed. Like, like the stakes haven't changed. Diana's still in a spot where she can't get out. And Hecate is, or she may be outside of Diana's body. But Diana is now full of all this magical power. And the question is, is this how the story is going to end? It's got, I think, two more issues. A Just, uh, Just League Dark tie-in. And The Witching Hour has its own solo book. So we don't quite know where this is going to go. But this is still really good i love the idea of the exorcism being effectively a back to basics idea okay it's still someone possessing someone else even if they are a god we should still be able to use the same principles of exorcisms i also love the idea that magic is needs to fundamentally change maybe hecate will succeed in changing magic but she won't be able to be in control of it that you know she'll be pushed back by all this power in diana and maybe the the tree of wonder will play a role in it overall though still good Next up is one of our new books, Old Lady Harley, Issue 1, because everyone loves Harley Quinn, until they don't. So, our story opens up with Cat Grant and her clones talking about world affairs. Yeah, Cat Grant cloned herself. So, how Atlantis is a state, it's part of the U.S. now, because of course we did. The Legion of Doom has taken over Mexico and renamed it Lexco, because that is who Lex Luthor is. Canada is infested with zombies. I guess I'm not the only person who didn't like Justice League United. And Power Girl is president because, sweet Jesus, yes. Yes. Anyway. Anyway, we then get a flashback, or, well, yes, to the past, where Harley kills the penguin for what he did to Coney Island, which is this amusement park, and she feels that she's gone too far, that she's gone to the dark and she can't get herself to the light. And she just sort of leaves. She leaves her friends behind and she goes to travel with the Joker. And the story cuts decades later in the present, well, this book's present, where Harley and her friend Red Tool, yes, Red Tool, it literally looks like Deadpool, looks like a parody of Deadpool, and they are fighting at Kraken Barrel because Atlantis is a, is a state now, and this fight happened because Red Tool sexually harassed one of the waitresses, and, you know, they escape only to be attacked by a group of laughing men, which seems to be a cult of Joker followers, and they're able to fire monsters from this gun, which is hilarious. And they say they're looking for the Joker, who Harley says has been dead for decades. And Harley then says, well, you know what? In my experience, dead doesn't really mean permanently dead. So they go to Gotham City because if Joker's anywhere, it's probably Gotham City. Or if anyone knows the truth about what the Joker's doing, and it's not Harley, it's got to be Batman. And they arrive at Gotham City to find it mostly deserted. Or at least empty. 
and they find Asriel, and Harley makes an Infinity Wars joke, pointing out that, hey, it looks like some villain snapped his fingers, and, you know, half of everyone left. And Asriel is not amused. He presume he begins to arrest Harley, and Harley and Asriel fight, and then it turns out Asriel isn't alone. There are at least many other Asriels, and they all effectively just jump Harley and Red Tool, and the two wake up in the Batcave to be met by Batman, but not just any Batman, Batman Beyond. So, Old Lady Harley issue one was, was all right. Um, this really isn't a book I usually look to, but I figured I'd give it a shot. Because when I thought of Old Lady Harley going by the cover, I guess I jumped the gun and thought that Harley from the future would meet Harley in the present and they'd have like this team up moment. But no, it's just Harley did a thing and then we cut to decades later to this out of continuity book, which is fine for Harley. And we just sort of go on this little adventure. Is the Joker dead? Why is there... There's also a cult dedicated to the Penguin. So we don't quite know what's going on here. And I probably won't be picking it up again later. Um, next up is Book of Magic. Books of Magic issue number one. So this is actually a book I was looking forward to out of the Vertigo line. You know, by Neil Gaiman and the Sandman. So our story begins with Timothy Hunter. And a rundown of his life. Namely from the story of the Books of Magic which introduced him. How Constantine the Phantom Stranger, Mystery, and Doctor Occult say he could be the greatest magician ever to exist and offered him a choice between magic and the mundane. And even though he thinks he said no, in reality, in the book, he said yes the moment that he that the Phantom Stranger asked, hey, do you want to come with me to learn about to learn about magic? He said yes to that, but the book ended with him choosing the mundane and then regretting it. So he has a dream where he did choose magic, and he wakes up in class, and it it sort of shows that Timothy Hunter is really not that popular. He's a bit of the odd kid out. It's not just because he looks like a Harry Potter knockoff, which he sort of did in the in the original book, but this one's way more obvious. And he's trying to convince people that you know he can do magic. The magic is real, and he gets him to into a couple of fights, and he's sort of the weird kid out. And his teacher, Dr. Rose, calls him in and says, look, I know you have magic, all right? I know because I have magic and I can sense it coming from you. And you want to learn how to do it. Well, the only way you're going to learn from that is you have to learn, you find your books of magic and to learn from it and make the magic what is meant to be within you. And she hands him an empty book and, you know, it will, he'll be able to read it when he's ready. You know, we don't quite know what ready means. It's vague, you know, character growth, um, Maybe lay on the bed or learn to read Latin. We don't know yet. Very Zatch Bell if you think about it. Tim then goes to talk to the to a homeless woman that I guess is his friend. Her name is Hetty, and he talks and he talks to her about you know he's he's not able to focus as well as he used to. And she hands him a yo-yo, thinking it's a fidget spinner. Although a yo-yo was turned into an owl in the original books of magic, and it was Timothy's yo-yo. So this could be a callback to that. When he gets home, he sees his dad watching TV, which he always does, and his dad says he heard about the fight and that he should be getting in fights unless he can win, and that fighting won't bring his mother back. Tim then tries to read the book Dr. Rose handed him, and it says that magic is neither good nor bad, and that only its use can determine its character, and that there are always consequences to magic. And Timothy doesn't care about this, he just wants, he just wants his mom back, and he closes the book and stares at a picture of him and his mom. Meanwhile, at the city dump, because, of course, a trio of magic users are watching Timothy and saying that some books shouldn't be read as one of them prepares to hurt Timothy as Dr. Rose watches. So, this was interesting. Um, real quick, I'm pretty sure Dr. Rose is Rose Psychic, who, if I'm not mistaken, is Dr. Occult's daughter. So, it's nice to see that they're keeping an eye on him, which was what uh, they all agreed upon when they left Timothy, think, with the idea that he chose the mundane over magic so it's nice to see that you know in some form or another they're all watching him and hopefully we'll see dr occult and mr e and the phantom stranger and constantine as well we'll see the whole shadow pact that should be fun and with that in mind we'll bring this video close here if you're new to the bucket thing don't forget to like comment share and subscribe feel free to check out some other videos on this channel it really helps if you read any of these books or if you read a book that you thought was really good this week. Uh, leave that down in the comment section as well. And I will catch you all later. This is the Bucket Think Tech signing off. May your fandom serve you well.